Well, I don't see my screen. Okay. Okay, welcome uh, everybody. And uh, thank you for taking a few minutes to, to join our, uh, our webinar here. And uh, we are just uh, waiting for people to log in. So uh, I will just ask all of you to take a few minutes and um, grab your coffee and settle down in your chair and uh, get comfortable and um, be ready to, uh, to attend our webinar here. We're uh, slowly seeing the numbers creep up. So we'll just uh, continue to give it a few minutes and ask for your patience um, as we get on with our, uh, with our webinar here. So thank you all for joining today. And we're just uh, watching the numbers click up. It uh, just takes a few minutes, folks, if you've been through these webinars before. Um, that's all. So once again, we're just going to uh, welcome everybody here in a few minutes. And uh, we'll get going through this, uh, get started here. Okay, folks, I think uh, we've allowed people to settle in. Hopefully you've grabbed your coffee or your water and your soft drink, et cetera, and um, you're settled down. And um, I'm just going to get us started here on our um, webinar here for the uh, Ottawa Valley branch. Um, so on behalf of the branch, uh, thank you all for taking a few minutes and uh, out of your day to come join. I know all of you are inundated with other Zoom or team meetings, and uh, I thank you for carving out a bit of time for us. Uh, so just to, because uh, our, I think our audience knows who we are, but we are the um, Ottawa Valley branch, um, and we are one of two branches, the other one being the West Central branch of the Ontario Public Works Association. And for those of you that don't know, um, the OPWA or the Ontario Public Works is one of uh, eight Canadian um, chapters that we have, uh, which are, we are all a part of the American Public Works Association who has 55 chapters. So we're all really part of a very large family, um, but um, more locally, we are the two branches that are part of the Auto Ontario Public Works Association, which is one of the eight Canadian chapters. So that's a little bit about our organization and uh, what we really do is we're out here to, to promote uh, public works um, in a very large context. Uh, we're not like PEO, which is engineers only, et cetera. We are an organization that embraces everything in public works, whether it be contractors, consultants, uh, suppliers, et cetera. And that's why we have a very diverse organization. Uh, I'm pleased today to um, also introduce Enrico, if you'll turn your uh, video on. So Enrico is the, uh, pre he was president elect last year. He is president now because the uh, Ontario Public Works has held their annual general meeting. And I'll be uh, happy to tell you that uh, he transitioned from president elect to president without any of the excitement that you might have seen on CNN or Fox News. So a very peaceful transition, I must say. Uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, working with Enrico for a number of years on the Ontario Public Works Board. And um, it's great that he's had an opportunity to now step up as president. So on behalf of Enrico um, and the Ontario Public Works, I'll ask Enrico to uh, please say a few words on behalf of OPWA. Go ahead, Enrico. Okay, well, thank you very much, Arup, for that introduction. Uh, good afternoon, Ottawa Valley Branch, bonjour to the board of directors, to fellow members of OPWA and to your guests. Uh, thank you for extending the invitation to join you at your annual general meeting and conference. Uh, today's agenda looks great with some interesting presentation, but it's always the AGM that's the tough part to get through. So, uh, but I'm sure Arup will do a fine job with that. As introduced, uh, my name is Enrico Stradioto and I am the 2021 president of OPWA. I've been a member of OPWA since 2010. I became chair of the education committee in 2012 
and then I joined the executive in 2014. My day job is with the Ontario Concrete Pipe Association, uh, which does have two member producers in the Ottawa area producing concrete pipe and precast products. I live in Guelph, I am married. We have three fantastic young kids and a dog. It was two weeks ago today that I accepted the role of president at the chapter's annual general meeting. I recall when I came home that day from the office, one of my rare trips to out of the house and to the office, I was telling my young kids around the supper table that I was now president of OPWA and their faces lit up. I'm not sure if their reaction was from watching the spectacle of the US president's inauguration on TV the day before, or if they just thought maybe being president had special privileges. But before I could take advantage of the moment, my wife, Jennifer, she quickly put things back into perspective. Anyways, all kidding aside, uh, I'm honored to be president of the Ontario chapter of APWA with its two branches, the Ottawa Valley branch and the West Central branch. My history of OPWA is relatively short compared to some. At the chapter's annual awards presentation that followed the AGM, Joe Johnson Jr. was honored with 25 years of service and support to the chapter. Our past president, Scott Stewart, was awarded the uh, last November the Life Member Award from APWA for 30 years of continuous membership. Both of those are amazing commitments to public works. I'm sure if asked, there would be many of you in the audience with the same credentials of service to public works, so well done. During my president's remarks, I delivered uh, two important messages. The first important message was stating the objectives for 2021. So they are number one, to seek more opportunity that will engage our current members and also new members to the chapter and its branches. Number two, to raise the voice of OPWA and to advocate for the public works. And number three, to widen the membership footprint of the chapter and its branches across Ontario. I look forward to working with the Ottawa Valley branch in hopes to achieve these objectives, but all of this will require effort and resources and people. So that leads me to my second important message that day, which was, the key to your success is to be involved with OPWA. I don't know how you may measure success, whether it's the advancement of your career, the growth of your knowledge in your respective fields, or the friends you make in public works, but I do know that the chapter and the branch is the center of it all. Two weeks ago, when the chapter had its AGM and annual awards presentation, we also had two speakers to make up the conference program. The conference theme was driving forward, adapting to change. Our keynote speaker spoke about the effects of change and the importance for us humans to foster the skill of adaptability in order to manage change. Her name was Nancy Watt, and she used the analogy of a wheel to represent all the things that are going on and all the change in our communities due to this pandemic. In the center of that wheel of change is the hub. And the hub, she said, is public works. It is public works that keeps our communities functioning in an orderly manner. I very much liked her representation. Well, here I am, and there you are, somewhere out there. Things are different now, and they've been different for the past 11 months. COVID has affected all of us, but we learn to adapt just like today's virtual event. Congratulations on delivering this event successfully. Business at the chapter has been no different. Last year, we had to pivot and do things differently. We created the new education program called Ontario Public Works Connects and delivered our first webinar in August via Zoom. We repeated webinars each month after and we have continued this program into 2021. January was busy, so the monthly webinars will resume in February. We need topics and we need speakers. So I encourage you or anyone here today, if you have a topic that is relevant, interesting and topical for your fellow members, please get in touch with the education committee. It's a great opportunity to share your knowledge with your fellow members. In-person events are currently on hold, as we know, but Zoom has given us a new avenue to engage our membership. Last October, we continued with the Right-of-Way Conference in a virtual format. The Right-of-Way Conference will repeat this year, 
but we're not sure at this time in which format. I guess time will tell. In early March, we will have our first ever virtual International Women's Day event. In April, we will have our first ever virtual IT symposium, which ironically, I must say, does seem quite fitting. In the months ahead, there will be more change and more first evers. I should note, contrary to the above, the chapter is hoping that it can hold its first in-person event for 2021, which is the ski day at Osler Bluffs in Collingwood on March 4th. Here's to fingers crossed. I know the Ottawa Valley branch has many of the same events and I wish you success in the planning and the fruition of those events. Let me use this opportunity now to deliver a challenge to this branch. And this challenge is gonna be repeated to the chapter and to the West Central branch. I would like to see the 2021 National Public Works Week in Ontario to be the biggest ever. The theme for National Public Works Week, which is still not formally announced by APWA, but I will secretly uh, mention it here, is Stronger Together. And it will take place on May 16th to the 22nd. Get started now in planning the biggest and the best National Public Works Week. Speaking from personal experience, I know what it takes to plan and organize such events, big or small. I've done many for OPWA in the past years. Arup and I met on the Education Committee, and he helped me for several years to organize our spring and fall technical workshops. I know it takes the help of many volunteers, but for a little hard work, there is success to be gained. So here's my third message for you today get involved with the branch. I look forward to staying involved with the Ottawa Valley branch. I hope the chapter and both branches can work closer together this year and find new opportunities that will engage our members and bring us new members. The chapter is here to support the branches. To that point, I'd like to use one example of how the chapter can show its support and did with its branches, its members and the community. Last November, a group petition was brought forward by Susan Liver of Stantec, one of your members of the branch, that condemned the acts of racism and hate crimes occurring on construction sites. I commend the initiative of a few individuals and the collective effort of the branch to bring this to the chapter's attention in order to use the collective voice of the public works to advocate for something better. Great work. With that, I'll end my remarks here. Stay connected to your branch. Stay connected to OPWA. Let's all hope for a healthy 2021. Thank you. Merci. Thank you so much, Enrico, for those uh, for those words, and uh, thank you for taking a few minutes to uh, tell us about the broader objectives of uh, Ontario Public Works Association. So I hope you'll stick around as much as you can. Uh, but thank you for those words. Um, I also wanted to point out, um, uh, by way of background, um, like I said, I've been on the OPWA for a while. I retired last August as director of the county's Leeds in Grenville. And, um, you know, through my retirement now, I've, I'm going to enjoy the opportunity to participate and do some of the things that Enrico has said that we want to move on and get going on in terms of branch relationship and in terms of some of the programs we want to deliver. Um, I would also be remiss, I forgot, I should have mentioned uh, Brian Barber, who is the uh, Executive Director of the Ontario Public Works Association. Uh, he is on here as a co-host today, uh, sort of our safety net, I will say, in the event uh, something goes wrong with, uh, with the uh, broadcast from here, and he's there to help us out, and he's behind the scenes and has been a tremendous support for us. Uh, to to uh, be able to use a platform like this, which again, in the spirit of cooperation, Enrico mentioned, uh, we've been able to to leverage the uh, the expertise uh, from OPWA to get the Zoom platform up and running and make it available to all our chapters. So uh, thank you again, Enrico, and um, we're going to carry on uh, with our, our present webinar uh, now. Just a few. Uh, a few little house rules I want to mention. I'm, I'm, I'm sure many of you have uh, been involved in Zoom meetings, and uh, I am going to just uh, ask you for your patience. Uh, you know, these uh, the odd beyond things happen beyond our control. This is a format we're all 
getting more and more used to doing. So there may be the odd technical issue. And if there is, I'm going to ask for your patience ahead of time. Um, if your screen freezes or things like that, sometimes it's best to, to rejoin the meeting and usually that takes care of it. Um, we, uh, we are, all, many of us are engineers here, so we do build in a redundancy. So that's why Brian is here in the background, even if anything happens to the broadcast center here, um, that Brian can step in and help out uh, as well. So uh, uh, again, many of you are probably uh, familiar with the webinar format. Um, as attendees, uh, you are all uh, muted so that we can have a, a more organized session here uh, for this kind of format. Uh, the selected panelists will speak, uh, will come in and out uh, of your screen as we move through. Uh, however, I want you to know that at the bottom of your screen or at the top of your screen, there will be, there are, um, you know, buttons for you to use. And I'm going to very much encourage you as our speakers uh, start talking here, that as you have questions, um, I would very much encourage you to uh, put the question into the Q&A feature. Um, and that way we will collect as many questions as we can during it while it's fresh in your mind and the speaker is speaking. And then of course, we will pause for a Q&A at the end of each speaker. So again, I'll remind our speakers to also encourage you during their presentation so that we can have a bit of dialogue on, on the presentations um, shortly after that. We may not be able to answer every single question, but we will do our best to get through there. Um, also, you will see at the bottom, if you move your cursor down to the bottom of your screen, as attendees, um, you will also see a uh, raise hand feature. We are going to be using that um, for the business part of our meeting today. And um, I'm just going to get people, so as a, um, um, as an attendee, you will see a series of buttons across the bottom. I believe you'll see a mute button, a chat button, uh, and a raise hand button, and a Q&A button. If you move your cursor down to the bottom of the screen, you will see that. So just uh, to get ourselves warmed up and practice it, could I just ask all our participants to click the raise hand button? Okay. So I have got uh, roughly 29 people who are raising their hands out of the 53 participants, but that's okay. It's a good start. So I'm going to clear that uh, for all of you right now. Um, great. And now I'm going to, we're just going to test this again just a little bit. I'm just going to ask uh, those of you that are going to be supporting uh, Tom Brady and his six Super Bowl rings uh, and Tampa Bay in the Super Bowl. Could you raise your hands? Yeah, it seems to be, looks like we have about, oh, Tom's not that popular, it looks like. Interesting. So interesting, we got about nine, nine hands or so. So I'm gonna have you lower your hands now. Those of you that are gonna support the young gunslinger from Kansas City, Patrick Mahomes and Kansas City, raise your hands, please. Uh -huh. Well, if you're gonna trust the odds from the uh, uh, Ontario Val Valley branch, I would uh, go and wager on Kansas City, Kansas City, so I would uh, think. So there we go, a little bit of fun on that and testing out uh, the raising of hands and it looks like it's working. So we're in good shape there. Okay, great. We're going to uh, kind of carry on here with our meeting. Um, so just uh, as an overview of our agenda, um, we are working, we're gonna work our way through the business meeting. Um, it is a bit dry and I understand it. So I do again, thank you uh, for joining and helping us through this part. You are the membership and it's important that you um, play a role in, in voting for some of these items here. Um, so we're going to go through the uh, the agenda, the minutes, the treasurer's report, uh, my report as the chair. Uh, we will then have our nominations for the 2021 uh, uh, board for Ottawa Valley Branch. Um, we're really, the, the transfer gal was a bit of fun because I'll explain I'm actually also the incoming uh, chair. So it's uh, kind of a redundancy there. Uh, and then we're going to move on to three, uh, the more fun part of our meeting and the part that I'm sure you are all waiting to to, um, to be a part of and, and, and participate in, which is that uh, we have our three presenters, the Ottawa Heritage Structure Preservation by Leslie Collins, 
the combined uh, sewage storage tunnel with uh, Colin Goodwin, Adrian Como from Stantec, and the Ottawa Stage 3 LRT overview with Paul Croft from Parsons. So we're very uh, fortunate that uh, these folks and our colleagues have volunteered their time to come and speak to and present some interesting projects that we'll find in here. So on that note, I'll uh, just ask, um, I'm gonna look to open and look for nominations for, I'm gonna look for a nomination for the, to uh, approve the agenda. So I would uh, very much like to look for a motion uh, to move to a uh, motion to move to approve the agenda. And I'm just looking here, uh, Sheldon uh, uh, has uh, moved his motion to do that. And Ian, I see has, uh, has approved it as a seconder. So uh, that'll be noted in the minutes and I uh, appreciate that. And we're gonna move on from there. Okay, great, thank you. Um, oh, sorry, we're not gonna move on. We, uh, we had a mover and a seconder, my fault folks. We are now going to ask uh, all those in favor of the agenda to please raise your hand. I'll give you all a few minutes to move forward and raise your hands. Okay, great. And I'm just gonna clear the screen. And all those against uh, the agenda, please raise your hand. And fortunately, we don't have anybody. So that's terrific. Oh, looks like we do have two people uh, objecting to the agenda, but the motion is carried to approve the agenda. Oh, people are taking it back now. They're all interesting. Okay, so we're clearing the, uh, Clearing the first one, so we did, did our first bit of voting there to adopt the agenda. So thank you all very much uh, on that. We're now going to move on to. I'm going to show you the uh, the minutes of the uh, meeting from uh, our our in 2000 and uh, second here. So this is our meeting record from February 11, 2020. Uh, these are the minutes of that. Uh, we basically um, move forward with a number of motions and the business items of the meeting that you uh, are experiencing right now. Uh, Jason Bete um, does his treasurer's report and that's coming up later again today. Uh, went through that. What's good is we have a fairly healthy um, balance there um, to draw upon, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, later today. Um, then we discussed uh, our um, activities in 2019. So we went through uh, all of our activities. You'll see a lot more activities we did in 2019 than, than you'll see in 2020. Then we had our nomination report um, for the current uh, board that's in front of you um, with the folks you see there that have been uh, very helpful getting us through this year, uh, 2020, a very difficult year for everybody. Um, then the, some of the formality of turning over the meeting chair to myself. And then we moved on with some, some very, very interesting presentations. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about those uh, in, um, in my uh, report uh, when we go over last year's, um, when we go over last year's, uh, last year's, uh, events. I'll walk you through that as we go through that. So the uh, so then moving to the minutes. Um, let's see, can I get uh, can I get someone to um, to make a motion to to move the, the minutes be approved? And I see, let's see here. So I've got uh, Barb St. Aubin for for moving it. And could I get a seconder for that? Okay, great. I see, uh, Megan, you have uh, seconded that. So that's great. So I'm going to clear all the hands and I'll just ask uh, all those in favor of the minutes, please raise your hand, all our attendees, please. Great, thank you. I see quite a number of hands uh, going up there and I'll lower that and I'll ask that I'll lower all hands, sorry. Thank you. And I'll ask the question, all those opposed to the minutes, please raise your hand. And we have no one opposed, so thank you all. And uh, the minutes from our meeting are now uh, approved. So thank you very much, everybody, for voting there. 
Okay, so at this point, I'll ask uh, Jason Bate if you could um, turn on your uh, video and un unmute yourself as well. And um, I'll give you the control in a second here, Jason. So just uh, great. And um, Jason Bate is our treasurer. And if Jason, if you wouldn't mind going ahead and delivering the, uh, the treasurer's report. Thank you, Arup. Um, okay, so time for the treasurer's report, everyone's favorite part of the annual general meeting, I'm sure. Um, so I'll make it as quick and painless as possible. So uh, here's a real quick summary of the activities we, we had last year. We had our annual general meeting, our ever popular ski day, our women's day event. And then that's right around when when we had uh, when the pandemic hit and everything shut down and we really didn't have any uh, any in person activities uh, af after that point, although we were able to have a timely uh, uh, webinar on MS teams, uh, which was a nice way of kind of introducing people to kind of a, a new way of uh, communicating and uh, and doing business. All right, so here is a summary of the finances from uh, from our 2020 activities. So we had revenues totaling $21,607.35, which really comprised ma majority of, of that was event registration. Uh, we had HST rebates that we get every year, typically. Uh, we did have some, some corporate sponsorship, which uh, which helped, uh, ops, helped offset some of our expenditures. Um, and similar to previous years, we have a couple of GICs that, uh, that, uh, that we have uh, in the bank that came to maturity. And um, then on the expenditure side, a little bit higher than our revenues, we had $23,113.65. Again, uh, typically for us, the big costs are associated with the uh, facility costs and uh, meals, hall rentals uh, and tickets for, for some of our activities. Um, we did have uh, payouts for uh, university scholarships. So we had one for the University of Ottawa, one for Carleton University uh, for $1,000 each. Uh, we had uh, charitable donations of $300. And again, our GICs that came to maturity automatically renew themselves. So we, we purchased those back and renewed them. And then just at the at the bottom, just some some mis miscellaneous expenditures for bank fees, and and we did buy some uh, OPWA thank you cards. Um, so really, a, a summary for that year: we had a I guess a, a net cash flow of minus one thousand five hundred and six dollars and thirty cents, uh, which again isn't isn't that worrisome given that we have a fairly healthy. Uh, healthy assets and healthy bank accounts. So our current bank account as of December 31st, 2020 was $11,078.78. And then we also have those, uh, those GICs that uh, kind of on the side. So our, our net assets are a healthy $20,768.59. And then as typical, we have to do a little bit of a, I guess, a, a budget for our upcoming year, uh, as you can see. And again, this is completely related to the current pandemic situation. We're forecasting uh, much lower expenditures and much lower, uh, much lower uh, revenues. And uh, again, just because we're probably not going to be hosting any uh, in-person activities, or if we are, it likely wouldn't be until probably uh, late in the fall or, or something like that. So, oops, I think somebody just backed me up. So, um, yeah, so we've, we've just assumed kind of a, a small token uh, revenues from res rev registrations if we're able to host anything. Again, we still get our a portion of membership fees, interest from from uh, our GICs, and and just in case there is some sort of token sponsorship, we've assumed that as well. Um, 
again, on the expenditure side, we have assumed that perhaps we would have some sort of event cost perhaps later in the year. Again, it would be something a lot more, more modest than what we've seen in the past. Uh, we would have $1,000 for university engineering scholarship. Um, we're anticipating still holding our Mike Shefflin student paper competition in a virtual format in uh, uh, this coming spring. Both universities seem to be in favor of trying to host that virtually. So we typically provide uh, $550 in basically prize money for the, the winning student team. Uh, something new this year is we have scholarships established with both universities, so we're now establishing a, a $500 uh, scholarship with Algonquin College, which we expect would, would actually start up this year. And again, just some miscellaneous uh, assumptions for miscellaneous expenditures. So again, we're forecasting, uh, a, I guess, a negative cash flow of over $2,000 based on this budget, but again, we're not necessarily overly concerned with that given kind of the, the healthy uh, bank account and, uh, and kind of assets that, that we currently have. And, and we do have some prospects on potential uh, corporate sponsorship that we're kind of working out that could go to help offset that, uh, that cash flow, a negative cash flow that we're currently seeing. So uh, in essence, that's, that's my, uh, my treasurer's reporter Roop. Great, um, thank you for that, Jason, and the explanation of the deficit. I will also add here that um, we also currently have uh, had interest from uh, one of um, uh, a sponsor who is looking to to participate in our in our organization with a sponsorship. And if that uh, does come through, and it uh, looks like a very high probability that that will come through, we just couldn't wrap it all up for this meeting. Um, that would essentially bring us back to the uh, uh, almost uh, a net zero cash flow. Um, and as per Jason's comment, it's an unusual year, and this is what uh, this is exactly why we have reserves. Uh, and as you can see, it's all going to a fairly good cause uh, in terms of uh, even if we don't get that sponsorship, we're quite comfortable with the reserves we have. That this is exactly what the intended purpose of using those reserves are. Um, so uh, thanks for the report, Jason. Much appreciated. Uh, so just, uh, I will, uh, I am looking for uh, someone to move for the uh, approval of the Susan, uh, let's see, yep, Susan Liber, thank you so much for moving it, and I'm looking for a seconder for that, um, Rob Gibb, thank you very much, uh, from RB Anderson, um, seconding it, so we have a mover and a seconder for this item and uh, I will ask everybody to lower everybody's hand and all those in favor of the budget to all our attendees, could you please raise your hands um, if you are in support of the budget. Give it a few more minutes. Okay, thank you all uh, very much. And uh, now I'll, I'll clear all the hands there. Uh, just uh, clear it at all. And uh, anyone who is uh, opposed uh, to the budget, please raise your hand. Seeing none, uh, that is approved. So we're moving forward with the budget. So thank you all very much uh, for voting on that. Uh, okay, so uh, we'll uh, carry on with our meeting. And um, again, thank you all for using the voting buttons and finding finding the raise hand and participating. Uh, you know, that we would much rather be doing this in person, but here we are. And thank you all for making an effort to, to work through our agenda this uh, for this um, business meeting. So uh, I'll just kind of recap. You heard a little bit about uh, the events. Uh, essentially, 2020 was a, a, a very challenging, sorry, a very challenging year for us. Um, as, as for almost everyone out there, uh, all of your organizations probably face this challenge. Uh, of the disruption to your business, but uh, you know we're we're all creative people, and we've all found ways to adapt. And so here we are, and we realized quickly that after our first few events uh, in the year, we had to move, start having discussions about them. I mean, I think at the beginning we were all struggling with what we were going to do, but for, for the first part of the year, we were quite successful. Our we had our AGM around uh, just around this time uh, last year, 
um, at a fantastic facility uh, at Algonquin College there. Uh, an incredible room that really facilitates the meeting. Um, if we, whenever we get back to something like this, if we'd like to go back there, I'd encourage you all very much to come and attend. It's just, just being in this place is, 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 quite, uh, is quite interesting. Um, we had a variety of speakers, uh, some excellent, uh, right across some diversity across the country, um, talking about a fairly large project in Halifax. Uh, Kevin Bainbridge delivered that from Robertson Consulting. Uh, our own Rob Gibb, who's on our executive, um, was kind enough to, to talk about the upgrades at the uh, Robert Pickard Sewage Treatment Plant, a uh, very interesting project. And then again, talking about diversity, we went all the way over to Yellowknife and we had Daphne join us and give her time to talk a little bit about a very interesting mine project uh, out in Yellowknife. So um, that was uh, very, very uh, eye-opening in terms of the magnitude, the scope, the complexity uh, and the politics of dealing with an incredible project like that. So we really had to thank all our speakers. And then of course, uh, on the keynote, uh, we had uh, Marjorie Shepard, um, you know, with Environment Canada. And uh, these are the people that keep track of all the data, of all the numbers uh, and, and the science behind what's happening uh, with our climate. And they're the ones that put together the information. She was nice enough to put it together in a format that we all could understand. Um, and then uh, present that to us. So that was, again, she was our keynote speaker and brought and opened our eyes, I think, to, to the amount of work that goes behind uh, some of the headlines that you hear about and some of the policy decisions that you hear about um, in the news from the federal government and, and um, other organizations. So that was that. And then, you know, we, uh, these are the kinds of events that we really enjoy um, that we're going to have to give up on at least for the a little bit of this year. Um, Mount Tramla, what a fantastic place. Uh, Jamie McDonald uh, from the City of Ottawa on our board uh, has been running this event, uh, you know, had about 40 participants, uh, a great opportunity. You get your ticket, you get, uh, you get transportation by bus so you can relax on the way up and sleep on the way back. Um, or vice versa. And it was a fantastic day from what I understand. And this really is one of those first out of the gate events that we like to, uh, we like to get our first opportunity to be in person and get some face to face in a fun environment. Um, and that was done last year. And um, we'll talk a little bit about what might happen this year. And then this became uh, really uh, led by Susan Liver. Uh, this really was our uh, signature event, um, really took on a life of its own. And we're so proud uh, that we're able to do this. Um, you can see that we had, you know, an 85 people event. We were able to provide lunch. Uh, there was some sponsorship to offset some of the costs. So an incredible event that came together in a fantastic way. And you can see here the diversity, again, of the speakers we had from academia. We had uh, uh, folks from Carleton University. Uh, we had someone, again, local uh, city of Ottawa at the Britannia Water Treatment Plant. Um, then we reached out to one of our uh, municipalities just kind of outside the city proper um, in the municipality that I'm in, in North Grenville, and the local uh, director of public works. She talked a little bit about, you know, the path she took from uh, working, uh, starting out in, in the municipality and working her way to the director level. Um, we had uh, a very pr prominent uh, consulting firm of Collier's Project Leaders come and talk to us about uh, uh, projects that they're involved in and uh, some of the thinking they have. And then, of course, we got someone from the National Research Council uh, speaking in some topics as well. So, uh, so again, uh, a great job, uh, Susan. Thank you. And uh, Susan is continuing to take on this signature event for us in uh, 2021. And uh, it'll be done obviously in a different format, but this is again, an event that is uh, gaining a great deal of popularity and is really becoming our main event uh, that we're able to deliver. And we were lucky to do that in person last year. And then um, as we were struggling, uh, as things started to shut down and we really couldn't do any in-person events, we moved on and um, tried something uh, virtual. This was a very topical uh, subject. It was about teams. I think early on, we were all kind of figuring out what uh, Zoom teams, et cetera, what uh, format we were gonna use. And we were all kind of playing around with how do we do meetings? How do we make the maximum use of these uh, platforms? 
And again, Rob Gibb, who I have uh, dubbed as our sort of IT expert or our technology guru or uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, he was um, um, very, we were very happy that he stepped up and as our own uh, team member, he came up and delivered this. Again, um, fairly popular. It was very topical, like I said, at the time. And we, uh, Rob took everybody through not only just to run presentations, but how do you hold different meetings in different formats, how do you use it for project management, and offering us a number of tips and tricks on how to, how to use Teams. So thank you, Rob, for delivering that on behalf of the branch. So that kind of in a nutshell is uh, what we did. We realized that um, uh, we, you know, there we struggled a little bit with how we were going to conduct business in the branch, and uh, we continued to hold meetings on a monthly basis. Um, and we started to think about looking ahead to what we were going to do, and um, so we were able to adapt to this meeting format and carry on with our executive team meetings to deal with any of the businesses for the branch. So that was uh, 2020. Um, so at this point, uh, we're going to move on to our next item which is the uh, nomination of the uh, board of directors for 2021. So uh, Amanda, if you can uh, turn on your uh, video, there you are, thank you. And take over control of the screen and uh, deliver your presentation on the uh, candidates, thank you. Thanks, Arup. Uh, so I put together the candidates for the 2021 Board of Directors. I'll go through them pretty quickly as I notice we are uh, behind time a bit. So our first, oh, there we go. Okay, so we've nominated Arup Mukherjee uh, from Arkham Solutions, uh, elect for a one-year term as chair. This year we uh, have nominated for co-vice two, co two uh, Chair, two vice chairs, co-vice chair Sheldon Dattenberger from JL Richards and Associates for one year term, as well as Ian Izzard from the city of Ottawa for one year term. And then myself as past chair uh, for one year term as well. Uh, treasurer, we uh, I've nominated Jason Bette from for a one year term and Megan McSween for secretary from Parsons for a one year term. Returning candidates for director, we have Sandra Mancini from the South Nation Conservation, Jamie McDonald from the City of Ottawa, Andrew Murray from Enbridge for two-year terms, and then re-elect for two-year terms, we have Andre Bork from Jacobs, Barbara Sedobe from Robinson Consultants, Susan Leiber from Stantec, Bergie alting mees from the City of Ottawa, Robertson Gibb from RV Anderson Associates Limited, whoops, sorry, and then New candidate for director, we uh, would like to nominate Sean Gibbons from Collier's Project Leaders for a two-year term. With that, I will pass it off to Arup. Great. Um, thanks, uh, Amanda. And uh, at this point, um, thank you for all your hard work. Uh, even though Amanda's on maternity leave, she uh, misses us so much. She still uh, participates regularly uh, along with her uh, with her daughter who often makes uh, her newborn daughter who often makes uh, cameo experience uh, appearances so thank you amanda for keeping it lively um so i'm looking for a um, a motion a movement someone to move for the approving the nominations and i'm just looking looking at our participants here uh jason Batez, thank you for making the motion to move this and i'm looking for a seconder and Sandra Mancini from South Nation Conservation Authority. Thank you so much, Sandra. So we are again, um, just going to ask, so we, the motion has been put forward and seconded. So I'll ask all our attendees to, um, if you are uh, in favor of the um, nominations report from Amanda, please raise your hands. Just waiting a little bit for people. Okay, hey, great. Thank you all very much. So I'm just going to clear that over your hand, all of your hands. Okay, and anyone who is opposed to the candidates bring foot forward. And there are none. So thank you all very much for voting that. So that is now carried. And uh, that brings us uh, to the transfer of the gavel. This is kind of uh, interesting. I'll just say a few words. Uh, normally, the uh, the uh, vice chair um, becomes 
uh, moves into the position of the chair. Uh, but given the highly unusual situation we had last year and the amount of impact it had on people's personal lives and their professional lives, um, we felt that we wanted to just to go a little bit slower in our succession planning. So the uh, the committee uh, came and approached me and said, uh, would you be willing to stay uh, run again for re-election of chair so that we keep everybody in place for one more year and get ourselves through this difficult transition year? Um, and I was uh, very, very happy to do that. And that's why this is kind of a kind of a point, but um, I still have a gavel here and uh, we'll just do this ceremonially. I'll just transfer the gavel from my right hand to my left hand and uh, that takes care of that part of the ceremony. And I thank you all for your votes um, and your nominations moving forward. So uh, that really takes us uh, to the end of our business meeting. And I am, um, just we do need to formally close the business meeting. So I'm looking uh, for a mover to adjourn the meeting. Okay, great. I see uh, Megan has put her hand up to adjourn the meeting and Ian Izzard has seconded. Uh, thank you very much folks for being on your toes there. Thank you so much. And uh, so again, we will uh, all lower our hands and I'll clear that screen. Okay, and all those in favor of adjourning the meeting, this is usually a popular one. All attendees in favor of adjourning the meeting, please raise your hands. And that, uh, like I said, uh, becomes quite popular. Anyone who's opposed to adjourning this uh, business meeting? Uh, I said, if you're opposed to adjourning the meeting, and okay. Anyways, that motion is carried. So thank you all for voting. And that really takes care of the business part of the meeting. And we are running just a little bit behind. So we'll try to move forward on our presenters fairly quickly here. So on that note, um, let's see now, we're going to move forward with the three presentations. Uh, Leslie's gonna be out of the gate first. Um, so Leslie would be kind enough to turn on your video and unmute yourself so you're ready to go and I'll read your introduction for you. Uh, so Leslie Collins is a, um, MCIP and, uh, and uh, also a registered professional planner, program manager with Heritage Planning Branch, City of Ottawa, is a professional um, urban planner uh, specializing in heritage conservation and worked as a heritage planner for the City of Ottawa from 2009 to 2019, which is a, a pretty good run. And since 2020, she has been the program manager for the city's, city's uh, Heritage Planning Branch. Leslie has a Masters of Science in Planning from the University of Ottawa and has been working as a heritage planner since 2006. Leslie joined the city in to, uh, city of Ottawa in 2009 and worked on many complex files, including the designation and adaptation, adaptive reuse of the Innovation Center at Bayview Yards, the designation redevelopment of the Medical Arts Building at 180 Metcalf Street, and the research uh, designation policy development for the Briarcliff Heritage Conservation District Canada's first mid-century modern heritage district. Leslie is passionate about heritage conservation and the role it plays in building a livable city. Leslie, all over to you. And I'm just going to, give me one second, I'm going to um, rest on this screen and we'll come back to Q&A at the end. And again, I encourage you as uh, participants to start uh, writing down your Q&A so that we can have a little bit of dialogue at the end. Leslie, all yours. Thank you, Arup. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me today. Um, I know you are a little bit behind in time, so I will uh, try to make this uh, concise. And But as Arup said, if you have any questions at all, feel free to uh, put them in the chat and I'll be happy to answer them. So uh, I thought I'd give you a bit of an overview of municipal heritage planning, and, and I've tried to put a bit of a public works twist on this, um, despite the three photos on the front slide, which are pretty houses. Um, we do actually do uh, a lot of work with public works um, of heritage. And uh, I'm gonna use a case study of a project that we worked on this, this summer past with Ian Izzard um, at the city uh, regarding uh, adaptive reuse of a bridge. So uh, I'll get started. So what is heritage planning? So at the city, at the municipal level, we are the area of urban planning that deals with the identification, evaluation, protection, restoration, and management of built heritage resources. 
So my team is within the planning department at the city of Ottawa, and uh, we are responsible for providing recommendations to city council on uh, designations, as well as on sort of alterations and changes to uh, heritage resources. So um, perhaps our most well-known file at the moment is the Chateau Laurier. Uh, <laughs> don't put anything in the chat about that, please. But um, just to give you an idea of the type of, of work that we do. So uh, in Ottawa, uh, at the city, we have over 3,700 designated properties under the Ontario Heritage Act, and that includes 21 heritage conservation districts uh, and over 5,000 listed properties. And I'll give you a little bit of a sense about what that means later. We have a heritage grant program for building restoration. We run a heritage tax incentive program, a plaque program. And I see that my text is, uh, is a bit messy here, but we also uh, run an awards program for uh, heritage conservation pro projects. So what is built heritage? Uh, so the physical structures and places that humans have built over time can be individual buildings, but uh, can also be uh, things like monuments, bridges, parks, areas, and cultural landscapes. So for instance, the picture on the right-hand side of the slide is a hydro substation that we just designated in uh, last, about a year ago now. Um, in, in cooperation with Hydro Ottawa, we designated five hydro substations dating from the early 20th century. And just to give you a sense of some of the types of things that are designated in Ottawa. So we have a mandate to deal with all areas of the city. And as you probably know, the city is uh, geographically huge. Um, so we have uh, rural things like churches, like the one at the top, St. Clair's Church. Um, we have more urban elements like the Strathcona Park Fountain, um, fans, sort of what you might think of as a typical heritage building, the Patterson Fleck House in Sandy Hill, or the house on the bottom, uh, left hand side or sorry right hand side of the screen uh, at 2607 Old Montreal Road in Cumberland but then we also have things like bridges the Minto bridges uh, which connect uh, through New Edinburgh and the Fleet Street aqueduct and pumping station are also designated and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later so we have three primary tools to identify properties of cultural heritage value or interest we have the heritage register individual designation under part four of the Heritage Act and uh, heritage conservation district designation under part five of the Heritage Act. And these tools have differing levels of protection that are offered to them and, um, and I think different implications depending on what it is that we're talking about. So just uh, as I said, I wanted to try and put a bit of a public works twist on this. So um, as I said, we, we have many heritage resources that uh, could fall into this category. Um, and we think, you know, from the municipal perspective, I think it's very important because public works reflect the growth of the city um, to a certain extent, evolution in values at the municipal level, and then changes in technology. So things like bridges and that sort of thing. Um, I mean, the, I've, I've included some buildings in here, and even though I know it's not it's sort of strictly the same as a bridge or, or something like that, but this building is the Champagne Bath, which uh, is one of two uh, former public baths that were built in the early 20th century in Ottawa um, that sort of illustrate that um, changing attitude towards uh, cleanliness and, and goes sort of a, uh, hand in hand with evolution and drinking water infrastructure and sort of the urbanization of the city. So some of our examples, as I said, include drinking water, hydroelectric infrastructure, bridges, municipal buildings with public functions like this one. Uh, if you're ever interested in trying to find out what is designated in Ottawa or listed, you can go on the city's Geo Ottawa um, mapping uh, service where we have a layer for heritage. So you can look at uh, heritage conservation districts. The purple triangles are individual designation and the blue are properties that are listed on the city's heritage register. And so if you're working on a project, for instance, that's located in within one of our heritage conservation districts and it has um, sort of above ground implications, let's say, uh, then there could be a requirement for approval under the Heritage Act. So the Heritage Register um, is a tool under the Ontario Heritage Act that allows the city to list properties that they believe to have potential cultural heritage value. Um, it's sort of a one level lower than uh, designation. The only um, restriction on properties that are listed on the on the register is that the owner has to provide 60 days notice in advance of demolition. So we have approximately 5,000 properties on our heritage register and I asked one of my team to do a bit of analysis on the data and we have um, 
we have 12 bridges that are listed and we have nine uh, sort of buildings that are categorized as utility, including uh, generating stations, et cetera. So here we have the Bank Street Bridge. Um, we have uh, hydro generating station number four. We have a bridge over the Jock River. We have a railway bridge out in Galetta and we have the Lemieux Island um, water filtration plant and the Cummings Bridge over the Rideau River. So this is just a, sort of an example of the fact that we have properties throughout the city. Um, some of you will be familiar with the uh, Ontario Bridge Checklist, which I'll talk about a bit later when I go into a case study. And then the next step is we have, on, we have heritage designation, which offers a greater level of protection. So it's regulated under the Ontario Heritage Act. We designate individual properties under part four of the Heritage Act and heritage districts under part five. And so the difference here, well, these have to be approved by council as well, but council has authority over alterations to designated properties and demolition. So if, if a property owner wants to demolish a heritage building or a heritage structure, they are required to get city council approval, for instance. Just a little bit of a uh, sort of fact-finding mission here in terms of what heritage is not. Um, it's often seen as an attempt to freeze property to make it undevelopable or, or that you can't change it. The idea is more that it's about managing the change that occurs. Um, it's not a requirement to open private property to the public. Uh, this is not as relevant to this group, but it's not a tool to develop to prevent development or infill in established neighborhoods. And it's not a way to regulate the use of a building or structure. Um, so we don't generally get involved in use um, of a building. So if, it, if it's changing use, as long as it doesn't impair the heritage value of the property, uh, we don't uh, really have anything to say about that. So individual designation uh, is designation of an individual property through a municipal bylaw, and it's for its cultural heritage value. So it can be a building, a structure, as I said, it can be a complex of buildings. Um, a couple of years ago, we designated the former uh, NR Can property at, on Booth Street uh, as a complex. It's going to also undergo a major redevelopment, but uh, we, we designated several buildings and laboratories there that were of cultural heritage value and they will be incorporated into the new development. City Council must vote uh, to designate a property after consultation with the Built Heritage Subcommittee, which is the subcommittee of council. Uh, we have approximately 335 properties in the city that are designated under part four. Um, this is a portion of one of those properties, which is the Fleet Street pumping station and aqueduct. And, it, and there are five bridges along there that are included in the designation. Heritage conservation districts are designated under part five of the Heritage Act and um, can range in size. We have some that are, you know, 10 to 12 buildings. And then we also have the entire former municipality of Rockcliffe Park, uh, which is about 750 buildings and it is every property is designated. Um, so we have 21 heritage conservation districts in, in Ottawa. Um, and within a heritage district, this is a bit of a piece that a lot of people don't know. Um, everything is included. So every, every property is designated regardless of its age. And we also often get involved in projects like, uh, pro you know, projects that might affect the public realm. So sidewalks and streetscapes and that sort of thing, um, as well as projects that affect private property. In order to designate a property under part four of the Heritage Act, so an individual property, um, we have to have it meet Ontario Regulation 0906, which requires that it have either design or physical value, historical or associative value, or contextual value. And I'll just quickly go through those. Uh, so associative or historical value is direct associations with a theme or a person or an institution, or it demonstrates the work of a significant architect, builder, artist, designer, uh, engineer, for instance. Um, or yields information that under, contributes to the understanding of the community. Um, this building shown here, some of you may recognize it's, it's from prior to its uh, rehabilitation, but it's, the, it's now the Innovation Center at Bayview Yards, but it was constructed as the City of Ottawa workshops in the 1940, uh, 1940s, yes, sorry. Um, and it has heritage value one for its association with the city and, and also for its association with sort of a former railroad hub industrial area in the Mechanicsville neighborhood. 
design or physical value is a little more self-explanatory perhaps. Um, this one is interesting because it also includes the category of high degree of technical or, or scientific achievement. And so I've included the aqueduct picture here um, because it, it's a very interesting piece of engineering work and that's part of its heritage value. Um, so even though physically it's, you know, it's, it's lovely, but it's not, uh, you know, a, a beautiful Queen Anne Revival building, it still has heritage value because it tells us something about, about the past and, and the evolution of the technology. And then finally would be contextual value. So uh, is the property important in defining, maintaining, or supporting the character of the area? Is it a landmark? Is it linked to its surroundings? Um, and so this property is one of those five hydro substations that we designated last year. This one's on King Edward Avenue. And uh, it has contextual value in that it's one of a grouping of sort of uh, utility slash institutional type buildings along King Edward Avenue um, that remind us of what it was historically. Because if, if you are familiar with the street, particularly this part of the street north of Rideau, it's a very different place than, uh, than it might have been um, you know, 70 or 80 years ago. So as I said, alterations and demolition um, to designated heritage properties are regulated by uh, the Ontario Heritage Act. So uh, when it's a significant project, a heritage permit must be issued by council prior to the issuance of a building permit. Uh, smaller projects can be processed under delegated authority to staff. Uh, but the project I'm going to use as an example today uh, required City Council approval. The tool that we use to uh, evaluate applications under the Heritage Act are the Standards and Guidelines for the Conservation of Historic Places in Canada. And that document was published originally in 2003 by Parks Canada and then revised uh, around 2012, I believe. It was adopted by City Council as, uh, as sort of the standards that would be used. And it's not a prescriptive document, it, it's more a philosophical sort of like these are the approaches you should take. So it allows for some flexibility, which is, uh, which is helpful because evaluating heritage applications can, uh, you know, um, there's not a very, it's not a one size fits all sort of approach. Oh, sorry. So the example I'm going to use today is the Booth Street Bridge. Um, as I mentioned, the Fleet Street pumping station, which you see in the top right hand side of this slide, is a designated heritage building, along with um, the, the aqueduct that you see on this map, which here's the pumping, oh, sorry, I'm going to go over here so you can see my cursor, I think. Here is the pumping station, and then the aqueduct runs all the way along, and then there are several bridges that cross the aqueduct that are um, part of the designated parcel. So water came in from the Ottawa River and came all the way down here and then went through the tail race and back out the other side um, to the pumping station. Cooley's Bridge is also part of this landscape. Um, you can see it here in the second picture. Um, it, is all, it is separately designated uh, under the Ontario Heritage Act as well. And the city is currently undertaking some rehabilitation work on that bridge. So um, some of you may know, whoops. Um, these are some more current photos of the Booth Street Bridge. Uh, some of you may know that the new Booth Street was built over top of the bridge um, as part of the LRT construction. And this bridge has been not used for several years. Uh, it is a closed spandrel stone bridge with a stone parapet that was constructed um, between 1873 and 1874. Uh, it crosses the aqueduct um, that brings, uh, and, and it was intended, you know, it was used as a, as a way of crossing the aqueduct um, onto Le Breton Flats when there was uh, residential and commercial development there. In 20, oh, sorry, I've got some historic photos here. So here's some historic photos of the bridge. Um, looking west towards the Old Street, Booth Street Bridge in 1903, <coughs> excuse me. And then again, the Booth Street Bridge in 1968. Sorry, I'm just having some, trying to arrange the, the Zoom meeting. Okay, um, so the bridge is owned by the city of Ottawa. Uh, there was a portion of the bridge um, taken down in 2016 due to some structural issues. And a 2018 structural review identified serious deficiencies in the bridge and that the center arch is in better condition than the extensions. So the stone faces of the east and west extensions were reported to be fair and poor, 
fair to poor condition due to cracking, spalling, and mortar loss. And I guess one of the things I forgot to add is that um, the bridge was expanded twice uh, during its lifespan. And, uh, and the goal now was to try to adapt the bridge for a new use uh, since it was no longer being used as a road bridge to be used as a pedestrian and um, cycling connection to Le Breton Flat. So as I said, the southern portion of the parapet wall was dismantled in 2016 due to structural issues. And so we were working with our colleagues at the city um, to figure out what the best approach to this uh, situation was. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Ontario Heritage Bridge Checklist, which triggers a uh, heritage impact assessment or a cultural heritage evaluation report, depending on the, the scope of the work. Um, so that was one of the things that was triggered through this project. So uh, as you can see, the proposal was to remove the east and west extensions of the bridge and to rehabilitate the center arch as a pedestrian cycling uh, transportation future pathway. So the, the image on the left-hand side of the screen shows kind of the existing condition uh, from a width perspective and then the proposed. So it was to narrow the width of the, of the bridge because it was no longer needed to be, whoops, sorry. It was no longer needed to be uh, that wide to be used as a, as a pedestrian and cycling uh, connection. So the restoration work was meant to be based on the original uh, Thomas Kiefer 1873 plans for the bridge, which you see here. Uh, this shows you a cross section of the bridge. Um, oh, sorry, not a cross section of the bridge. So, oh yes, it does. <laughs> um, one of the interesting issues we had uh, with this project was the height of the parapet wall and the requirements associated with safety. Um, so the existing wall is not high enough. So what do we do to, to increase its height to ensure for safety if it's being used as a, um, as a pedestrian and cycling facility? So you'll see, you know, the existing cross section is much wider, obviously, than the proposed. And this shows you the west elevation showing the rehabilitated bridge. Um, so here you can see the aqueduct, which has its, it, the, pipe within it and the concrete support for the pipe. Um, at this point, um, this, these were the plans that we brought forward to city council for approval. And, you know, many questions remain because until you get in there and open it up, it's hard to know what's, what's underneath. So we were basing our recommendation on our sort of best guess um, and the condition. So at the point that we brought this forward, you know, it's unknown uh, whether the original center arch and its elements uh, remain intact or if they were removed. Um, so if, if when the work commences, um, we determine that, you know, it hasn't, it, that they aren't there, um, they will be restored uh, using the reclaimed and reconstructed stone from the dismantled portions. And just sort of to finalize, to finish up here, I, you know, I mean, some of the issues that we considered were, what was the period of highest significance? So yes, we were, we were permitting um, the restoration to 1873 geometry, but we did have a discussion around the fact that the additions to the bridge that made it wider occurred in the early 1900s. And those additions reflected the growth of Le Breton Flats and the need for, for a bigger bridge. And so was removing those additions, sort of removing some of the um, heritage value of the bridge. Ultimately, we decided that given, given the programmatic requirements, number one, and number two, given the fact that reducing this geometry would make it match better with the remainder of the, uh, of the bridges around um, as part of this designation, that it made a certain amount of sense that the entire um, complex reflected the 1873 um, sort of state of affairs. Um, and then the final one, as I mentioned a little earlier, was how to deal with safety and code issues. So there was a discussion about simply increasing the height of the stone wall using stone. Um, but what we ultimately landed on was sort of a railing on top of the stone wall that was more contemporary in nature and that read as a new piece in order to distinguish it from being uh, historic. So um, I see that I'm at time and that it for me. So I'll pass it over to Arup in case there's any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Leslie. And thank you for uh, taking us through very much what uh, we considered our uh, 
you know, public works oriented uh, heritage uh, planning. So we appreciate that. Um, you know, I know, Leslie, you've got to run to another appointment and uh, we are a little pressed. So I think I'm just going to continue asking people to submit any Q&As uh, through, through this uh, webinar. And uh, we, we can always get back to you and get some answers back in the interest of of kind of carrying on. So thank you, appreciate your time, Leslie, and I appreciate your effort in helping out the, the Ottawa Valley branch and bringing us uh, some of this information uh, to, to, to our membership. Thank you very much and uh, good luck. Thanks, happy to be here. And uh, if you have any questions you wanna send along later, I'm happy to answer them. Awesome, okay. thank you so much, Leslie. Have a great day, everybody. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Okay, so we're going to, uh, move on. I do, see, I do see some questions there, but we're going to uh, carry on at this point uh, to our next presentation, which is a combined sewage and storage tunnel. And um, Colin and Adrian, uh, again, just to sort of minimize the time a little bit, uh, Colin is a professional engineer, uh, contract administrator with Stantec, specializing, as you can see, I'm not going to read all of it, uh, specializing in treatment plants and control and pumping stations, um, he's worked on a number of projects. He's uh, certainly been involved in the CSST uh, for a number of years uh, and, and is currently and has been the contract administrator. So we actually have two speakers here. So we have Colin and then we have uh, Adrian Camo, who, um, who is a, a, a master's of engineering and a PNG, uh, vice president, water chief Ur engineer, urban water resources, Stantec. Uh, and Adrian is uh, vice president with Stantec. And again, um, his background is from the University of Dalhousie, uh, 31 years in the field and uh, has led a number of multidisciplinary teams uh, over the years and, um, and is Stantec's manager for the projects being, uh, for the project being presented today. So Adrian, if I can uh, have you start sharing your screen and I think you're up first and then you and Colin will We'll go uh, exchange uh, screens. Thank you so much, guys. Great. Thank you, Arup, and uh, thank you to the OPWA, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, on behalf of uh, the City of Ottawa and, and our entire project team, Colin and I are, uh, are pleased to have the opportunity today to, to present what effectively amounts to uh, uh, close to 15 years of, of work in, in supporting the city in, uh, in meeting their wet weather flow management and combined to world the flow objectives. Um, so uh, again, thank you for, for the opportunity to, uh, to present today. Um, our, our presentation is gonna be in two parts uh, where I'll start off um, in the first part with a, a focus on, on how in looking at system needs holistically and taking an integrated planning approach, the city of Ottawa and we um, are able to come up with multi-purpose, multi-benefit solutions that uh, maximize the investment in the infrastructure that we build. So I'll give a perspective on, on uh, how um, we developed that solution into what ultimately has become the combined sewage storage tunnel project as, as one of the main components of that overall solution. And then Colin will pick up in uh, and, and focusing in on the, now that the system is, is commissioned and operational, the importance of operational integration throughout the process from the very beginning in the development of the concept through design and, um, and implementation and construction. Okay. So starting off with that first part, um, you'll see this theme come, come through in terms of the overall functional objectives uh, and looking at things holistically, we're looking at combined sewer overflow control to the uh, Ottawa River, looking at flood risk reduction within the, uh, within, within the area, as well as asset renewal. And all these things, three things together, um, looking to come up with a, a multi-purpose, multi-benefit solution. One of the main drivers in the overall process is the protection of one of our, uh, one of our most valuable resources, the, the Ottawa River. And with that has come the Ottawa River Action Plan, which is, is a collection of 17 projects um, to do just that, to protect the, uh, the, the health, uh, maintain the health of the Ottawa River of which a big component of that is the combined sewer overflow control, minimizing the discharge discharges of untreated sewage during wet weather flow events to, to the river. And two of the key projects to do that uh, have been the real-time control implementation first, 
uh, followed then by the implementation of this combined sewage storage tunnel, as uh, we call it the CSST. So in terms of CSO controls objectives specifically, uh, of course, what we're looking to do is to reduce the volume and the frequency of overflows to, uh, to the river. Um, from a, uh, a compliance perspective, um, uh, provincial policy objectives and, and guidelines require that at minimum uh, we capture and treat 90% um, of the wet weather flow that is generated during a typical year, during an average year. And in cases like Ottawa, where there are body contact uses, and in this particular case, a downstream beach at, at Petrie Island, further a level of control to um, minimize the frequency of overflows and to have no more than two overflows per year on average uh, during the swimming season. Through this whole process of development of the Ottawa River Action Plan, a big part of it was public consultation. And uh, as you can imagine, the public, uh, you know, uh, this, this, uh, uh, has the expectation that there should be no overflows at all, no raw sewage going into, into the river. Um, but through that process, um, you know, it was a, a public education uh, component to that to, to show that the complete elimination of overflows to the river uh, would be uh, in the order of two two and a half billion dollars to, to achieve that complete separation of, of the entire system. But for a, a more effective solution, uh, something around the order of 250 million, uh, an enhanced level of control could be provided um, that uh, adequately protects the, the river while also providing relief uh, to avoid the, uh, the, the occurrence or uh, the risk of, of flooding within the, uh, within the city core. So with that comes an enhanced CSO uh, solution where uh, city council has uh, committed to uh, advancing this design on the basis of uh, achieving no overflows or on the design basis of no overflows during the average design year, which ultimately leaves, leaves us with uh, a performance expectation of somewhere around between one and two overflows on average each year. So better than than uh, what would be required by provincial policy objectives. I'll give you a bit of context in terms of the overall uh, area. Um, what we're showing here is the interceptor system that was built in the early 60s, around 1960, so it's about 60 years old now, that was built to intercept what previously were uh, direct discharges to, uh, to the Ottawa River. Um, bring all of the, the, uh, the wastewater and a certain amount of wet weather flow to treatment at the central treatment plant at, uh, at Ropac, uh, Robert O. Pickard Environmental Center. Like most municipalities, the city of Ottawa first developed as a combined sewer system in, in blue here and then rapidly grew uh, with separated sewers um, uh, through the 50s and, and onwards. So here, what we have is a service area that services uh, a third of the population of the city of Ottawa, about 300,000 people. Um, so we're, we're dealing with uh, an issue of having to address combined sewer overflows, the risk of, of flooding in these combined sewer areas, but also uh, having the ability to, um, to be able to sustain the operation of this aging sewer system where uh, this carries a significant amount of flow, very difficult to inspect and to uh, rehabilitate to, to maintain the integrity of the system beyond uh, its service, uh, designated service life. So, these are the three main um, objectives, CSO control, basement flooding, and uh, redu risk reduction, and also um, renewal of aging assets. So starting off, um, a first step here was in, in, and this goes back to 2005, around 2005, the need to rehabilitate the existing flow control structures along this system, again, built in, in around 1960. Um, so in doing that, this gave us the opportunity to, to look at the system and say, can we do better with what we already have in the ground? And this graphic here is, is, is one that was pulled together by um, City of Ottawa and based on, on monitoring information that they were collecting in the overflows as well as in the interceptor system. What this shows is uh, this is data when overflows were actually happening. And what they were able to show is that when overflows were happening, 31% of the time, the interceptor was less than half full. Another 
33% of the time, it was between half full and full. So clearly a good 60, 65% of the time, there was still room in that interceptor to capture more flow and reduce the amount of, of overflows that were occurring. Um, so with that led us to the development of the real-time control project. So we upgraded the, um, the slow control regulators along the interceptor system and, and put essentially intelligence within these flow control st structures. So what we retrofitted them with was a series of modul flow modulation gates so that when an event occurs, the gates open up uh, to fill the interceptor and keep it full for, uh, throughout the event. So they modulate then to keep it full and avoid it uh, from overloading. Um, and just by doing that, what we were able to achieve is consistently from year to year, a 65 and even 70% reduction in the volume of overflow in, in every year. So um, that, but just by doing that, that investment um, allowed the city to achieve and even exceed the minimum requirement for volumetric control of 90%. And typically um, what, what uh, the city achieves is 95% control or even better in, in each year. So very successful in terms of um, meeting minimum requirements from a volumetric perspective, which then gives us the opportunity to look how can we do more and, and better and, and achieve this enhanced level of control. This graphic shows um, the effect of real-time control. In, in the, the back row here, what we see is the overflows during that average year. So from the small events to the larger events causing more overflow. With real-time control, uh, what we see is the front row here is how much these events are reduced in terms of volume. We still end up with about 20 overflows per year uh, on average with this. Um, and so our next step here is how do we control the remainder um, where these last two uh, would be permitted under um, policy objectives provincially, but with the enhanced level of control that's sought here, we then moved to finding a solution that could provide us with the level of control to, to capture um, events of this size as well. So this is again, based on the average year. So how do we do that? Um, through looking at various alternatives, what we identified is that we would need about 43,000 cubic meters of storage to be added within the system. Next step was to look at, well, where do we provide that storage? How do we provide that storage? So through an environmental assessment study, functional assessment study, we looked at various alternatives from storage tanks at individual locations, storage shafts, tunnels, uh, combinations of, of tanks and, and tunnels. And what we found is that the most effective way that we could do this was to provide a, a linear tunnel uh, along the length of the interceptor to capture um, flows, overflows that were occurring at um, at, at these key locations and the ability to, to share the storage between these locations gave us the, the most flexibility. In doing that, we're also looking at basement flooding uh, risk within, within the study area. And, and here um, the city had, had, had been developing a plan for uh, overflow or sorry, uh, basement flooding risk reduction within the, the central core. And they'd come up with a solution that had many uh, sewer relief uh, projects at, uh, at the street level, uh, a very disruptive solution, could be effective, but very disruptive in, in many projects where we started to look at this uh, holistically and seeing that, well, if we could provide a high level outlet to the river for these rare events, uh, these are events that, that happen uh, not every year, every two year or five year, uh, uh, or, or even rarer than that, that cause flooding, um, if we had that outlet, um, it would improve the level of service that could be provided in the downtown core, uh, as well as, as uh, provide a less disruptive solution. This then gave us the opportunity to link these two tunnels or these two pipes together uh, to provide a dual purpose, to ultimately provide the storage we need for, for combined sewer overflow control, as well as provide that, that, that flood relief. So the way this works is that um, we have the, this north-south tunnel, which actually outlets at the, at the bottom of the Supreme Court building into, into the river. <clears throat> and here we have the uh, east-west tunnel that, that takes the flow um, to the interceptor further downstream and, and to the plant for treatment. So during typical events, um, the tunnel fills and, 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 and retains the, the extra volume that's required to reduce the 
the frequency of overflows. But when we have major storm events, it does provide that relief in the downtown core so that um, uh, the flow has a, a, an outlet to reduce the risk of flooding in, in the core. So with that, um, we come up with um, a solution that is two interconnected tunnels. The, the CSSD is two interconnected tunnels, uh, a four kilometer long east-west tunnel that drains by gravity back into the system um, that also provides a much needed uh, operational flexibility and as well as operational uh, resiliency in that now it's possible to, to divert most of the flow from the interceptor system into this, uh, this tunnel temporarily so that it can be inspected and ultimately rehabilitated to extend its, its life. Um, these two tunnels can operate in parallel to, to provide the storage along with the north-south tunnel to achieve the enhanced level of CSO control. We have a, an enhanced solution for basement flood risk reduction and that critical twinning of the, uh, or the twinning of a critical piece of infrastructure for the city. And on top of that, this solution is very flexible in that in the future, it could be extended all the way to the plant to fully uh, twin the, uh, the entirety of the interceptor system and providing even more storage volume if necessary in the future. Um, so there we have um, a multi-benefit, multi-purpose solution that has maximized the investment that is being made in, in this infrastructure. So with that, I'll hand it over to Colin to uh, talk about the importance of operational integration. All right, thanks, Adrian. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'll try and keep it brief um, just because we're running a little bit over time. Um, but when Adrian and I were asked to do a presentation related to the CSST for this group, um, we thought instead of going through a case study of exactly what was built, um, we figured a lot of people may not have heard necessarily, I've heard about the project, but not necessarily what it was for. So now that Adrian's kind of gone through that integrated planning approach and what the ultimate project was, um, Adrian had mentioned at the onset that the project went into operation uh, just in November. And so what we did was a bit of a reflection on what worked well in going through design through construction um, that I think sets us apart from other projects. Um, I have a lot of friends and stuff that would say, oh, that's neat, you, you worked on design and construction of a tunnel. And on reflection, it's not really a design of a tunnel itself at all that was the tricky part. It's, it's more about how do you build this tunnel, which is a means to an end, to store flow and provide these added benefits for the city and how to integrate with their existing wet weather flow control system with the real-time control regulators and with the city's own operation and maintenance uh, uh, protocols and plans. So, like I said, I'd like to think that we did this, you know, up front um, with a, a set purpose at the start of the project. However, I think this is really just something that was done inherently, and I don't think we are reinventing the wheel. Um, and this diagram here, what we're trying to illustrate is, is this approach that as you're going through the different uh, phases of a project's life cycle, is having a focus on the end user and then how this new piece of infrastructure will fit with an existing system is absolutely critical. And uh, what we're going to try and do is kind of run through this to give some examples of key things that we think worked well and ultimately led to a successful startup and commissioning of the system. So at the concept stage, Adrian mentioned, we looked at a multitude of different solutions of what could provide that CSO control and going towards that tunnel solution and eventually something that could act as a twin essentially of the iOS through the downtown core it's easy to put a line on paper, but it's a different thing to bring in practitioners and people that have constructed tunnels of this nature, uh, consulting with the operations group of the city to make sure that, yeah, that will be feasible to do physically through downtown and it'll work with the city's infrastructure at the concept stage. And then going from concept into design is really focusing in on, well, exactly what are we trying to achieve with this piece of infrastructure and get, establish that form and function. And then moving from design into construction, the operational integration focus is really on how are we going to get this thing in the service, how are we going to do it um, and build it with a live system. And all that together, if done properly, I think is it leads to successful operational integration. Um, so to try and illustrate this, I kind of broke this down into three themes. The first being hydraulic performance. So, you know, the base hydraulic performance issue is to achieve CSO control. But going beyond that is how do you construct and tie into um, a live 2100 millimeter diameter sewer 
without impacting upstream users and without um, compromising the integrity of the system. A sustainable solution, not in the sense that it's greenhouse gases or anything like that, but making sure that it's maintainable and operable by the city. And then operational change management is going through the design process and construction with the ops group to make sure that they have the tools necessary to properly maintain and run the system and it'll work with the existing um, plans that they have. Um, so I've already kind of talked to this, so I think I'll skip right over it, um, but essentially that's just looking at tunneling feasibility and then combining that with what can we get out of the solution. So on the hydraulic performance side of things, right off the hop, the operations group had come forward during design and said, let's try and think about different ways that we could leverage the infrastructure to be able to use it in a different manner. So Adrian alluded to it in the previous slide that they wanted the ability to be able to flip flow or most of the flow using the uh, regulator sites from the iOS into the EWT to allow uh, folks to do inspection and maintenance of the iOS in the future. So another aspect is looking at flow management. So going into construction from design, often we tell contractors um, what we want built and we shouldn't tell them how we want it built. And that's because we want to leverage their expertise. So working with the city, we could establish the key constraints. So if you're working on this sewer, these are your, the box that you have to play within. And then we were able to provide uh, concepts and strategies that we could give to the contractors suggestions on how they could do it, but leverage their expertise in construction in consultation with our folks and with the city to come up with the best approach uh, to construct in these uh, difficult conditions. Um, on the sustainable solution front, this is really about taking a deep dive at the, even at the design stage, whether it's on 2D drawings or 3D models, and looking at a piece of infrastructure and saying, how is the operations group gonna go inside a confined space, which most of these sites are to maintain a gate or to change out a level meter. Um, and that really revolves around providing good access for ventilation, for line to direct line of sight for people being tied off. And then in the construction phase, it was looking at, well, that was great what we did on paper. Now let's go into them before we turn it over, check for interferences, whether you're nicking your shoulder on a, a maintenance hole lid when you're entering, um, that type of thing and making the, the right adjustments needed before they took it over. And then operational change management, This the biggest part of this I think came during the real-time control implementation back in 2010, which was when this came online, it gave the city operations group uh, basically a new role. So taking what they did at the plant of having a process technologist that oversees the, the SCADA system for what's going on at the plant, and then adapting that for everything outside of the plant for real-time control regulators, and then eventually the sanitary and stormwater pumping stations and critical maintenance holes. And then for CSST coming online, it was about building up uh, the operations group's knowledge well in advance of taking the system over through a series of different um, operator training programs aimed at senior management at the process technologist level and also aimed at the frontline maintenance staff to make sure that by the time we got to commissioning and startup, none of this was new for the operations folks. They'd been involved. They knew what they were taking over right away, uh, which led to a lot less problems in, in, in the process of going through startup. So the last piece I'll touch on before I, I give, the, give the mic back to Arup and to Paul is just talking about on the commissioning front. Um, I think with the CSST, we have to think about this a little bit different uh, than say a standalone pumping station because you've got a, a system that's spread across a wide geographic area that's controlling um, live flow conditions. So we don't have the ability to turn off and turn on taps of, of sewers that we're connected to. So we really had to compartmentalize what the project was into components and then basically take everything that we could offline and test as fast as we could and then keep all the tricky stuff where we're dealing with live flow conditions until it was absolutely necessary and then putting all the pieces back together. So the six kind of parts that I'll go through, I think illustrate some of the, the key things that we took away from it that we'll certainly be leveraging on future projects. Uh, the first one being on live system planning. So again, the fact that we are tying into live collector sewers to divert flow from those into the new CSST uh, really required a lot of forethought. So during the commissioning phase, you can install a gate 
And then it's uh, really up to how do I test this thing? If I close that gate, I'm going to be sending flow potentially towards an overflow location, causing a combined or a sanitary sewer overflow. Um, so again, on the compartmentalizing side of things, taking the CSST and breaking it down into components was absolutely critical. And then using you know, your traditional bottom-up commissioning approach. So taking the system, breaking it down into individual pieces of equipment, and then basically establishing, we'll get this set of equipment operating on its own, and then we'll group it with the next one beside it into bigger systems until you can lump sites and test the whole system as a whole. Um, I guess another thing I wanted to highlight here was um, the approach that we took for giving the right job to the right people through this process. Uh, a lot of times, I think on design bid build projects, we have a tendency to download uh, a lot of responsibility to contractors on the commissioning side of things. Um, so what we did with CSST was look at it a little bit differently and say, the contractor is, is really their expertise falls in, in constructing this physical piece. And then once it gets beyond that and it starts to interact with other live flow conditions or other sites, this is where we came in with the city, had the contractor there as support, and then we took over that commissioning sequence. And that was set up at the design phase built into the contract document. So it was upfront for everybody going into it at an early stage. And I think this really made a big difference on getting this successfully done. Let's try to advance here. So technical difficulties. So on the, the next side of things was really looking at that whole offloading approach. So we have all these different sites that need to be tested. And what we did was break down the schedule into identifying anything that was quote unquote offline. So something that's not affected by another site's operation or something that's not affected by live flow conditions. And then we worked with our contractor to front load that work, get it done as quickly as it could be done and then work with the city to do the testing and basically get it ready for startup and then put it on the shelf. And what that did was lead to, at the back end of the commissioning and testing phase, having those critical sites where uh, there's live flow conditions so that we were minimizing the risk on the project schedule that way. That's, I can't stress the importance of this. So, And then on the live testing front, Again, each one of these sites, if you're controlling flow, we have to do a detailed assessment with the city to say, if this gate fails, what happens? Um, and develop all those prerequisites along the way that needed to be done. And then lastly, um, with a CSST, it's a live flow system. It's dependent on rainfall. So we can't start it up and then watch it for a couple of weeks and say, yep, it works. We have to get it running to the best of that we could with testing certain scenarios. And then right now, it's sitting there waiting for rainfall to come and we will be working with the city over the next year or so to really look at each one of these events and say well is it working properly do we need to optimize set points or do we need to make any changes um, so i realize i've sped through this fairly quickly but trying to keep this thing on track um, so in summary i think really um really what adrian and i were trying to get across here is that from an integrated planning approach I think that really gives you your best bang for your buck of looking at a piece of infrastructure and trying to get multiple benefits out of it, out of that investment. And then with the operational design philosophy, which again, isn't reinventing the wheel, but keeping it top of mind is constructing with the end user in mind, as well as trying to figure out how this piece of infrastructure will suit into an existing system. Um, and I don't think that this concept is really just, you know, we're doing a, this case study based on the CSST, which is wet weather flow sewer system, but that concept is directly applicable to anything from building a new hockey rink um, or a new transportation project. It's just about looking at the end use in mind and then focusing on how are we going to integrate this at the end of the day. And keeping that in mind through all these phases of the project. Um, in the CSST case was uh, very successful, and I think it's an, an applicable lesson or top of mind thing for other projects. So with that, Arup, I'll turn it back to you. Great, uh, thank you, Colin, and uh, thank you, Adrian, for, for something very informative there for us. Uh, and we will, um, again, just, uh, we're going to just kind of keep ourselves going here. Uh, I don't actually see a lot of Q&A here, so I'm going to uh, suggest that your presentation was mesmerizing enough that you got uh, 
everybody completely glued to the screen and uh, not a lot of questions there, but uh, very complex. And uh, thank you for taking the time to walk us through and make it a little bit easier for us to understand the complexity of that uh, fairly massive project. That's fairly well known, I think, to anybody in the engineering field. So that's great. Again, I would encourage anybody, if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to write them down, even if they're not done during this presentation. If you do it by the end of the webinar, we will um, we will pass it on to the right speaker and make sure you get your your answer back. So we're gonna we're gonna kind of keep the ball rolling here. Uh, on that note, I'll just uh, I'll note that it is uh, two forty. And not to rush Paul, but if uh, just let people know that if you're able to hang on for an extra 10, uh, 10 minutes or so, I think that'll be enough time for Paul to wrap up. And uh, I know you may have other events to go to, and that's understandable. So for those participants can hang on an extra 10 minutes, I would ask you to, if you could do that, that would be great. Um, so moving on to uh, Paul Croft, uh, who's a senior project manager at Parsons, also a registered professional planner. Uh, dealing with uh, stage three, my goodness, we're already at stage three. So how about that? Uh, for something that was going to be so futuristic, we're already at stage three, which is great news. So Paul uh, has 20 years of experience. Uh, for 14, last 14, he's been based out of Ottawa, been involved uh, in a number of functional planning studies and preliminary engineering and environmental projects. And he's uh, very much uh, hands-on with this project, clearly. So uh, Paul, I'm going to... Uh, ask you to take over and uh, start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arup, and uh, thanks, thanks everybody else. Uh, I have a bit of a hard act to follow in that I actually, um, oh, sorry about that. So we've heard from Leslie and Adrian and, and Colin, and they, they had actual projects to share. And I, I have more of an idea because stage three isn't, really, it's not a thing yet, it's not a project, um, it's an idea. And I, we, I, having been involved in the environmental assessment studies for all three phases so far of Ottawa's LRT, it's uh, very interesting to me how we've gone from why are we building LRT to, to why aren't we building it faster? Um, I'll just start a little bit of background. Um, I'll try to keep this short for everybody. This is where we were basically September 14th, 2019, the, the opening of the Confederation Line from Tunnish Pasture to Blair, along with the what, what's called the Trillium Line, which is the original O-Train, which has actually been in operation since 2001, although it's currently closed now until the end of next year while they start, um, while they construct phase two. Speaking of phase two, that, is, that takes an extension of the Confederation line east and west, so east from Blair Station into Orleans to Trim Road, and west from Tunney's Pasture to Moody Drive and Algonquin Station, which is formerly known as Baseline, along with an extension of the Trillium line from Greenboro down to Lime Bank and, and, um, and the airport. And you can see here in advance of stage two opening, OC Transpo has um, designated a new route structure. So the Confederation Line will actually be a combination of Line 1, which will run from Algonquin to Trim, and Line 3 from Trim to Moody Drive, and 2 from Bayview to Line Bank, and Line 4 will be the airport shuttle. Moving on from there, again, now we're, we're moving into Stage 3, and there's still there's a lot of questions as to, as to what Stage 3 and actually is, and there is a fair bit of uncertainty around it, because at the moment, um, there's no funding, there's no timelines associated with it. We don't know whether all three parts of stage three will be built together, uh, when they will be built, and how they will be built, because at least for the Canada and Barhaven extensions, we've developed some potential phasing for those lines, because these are actually, um, LRT is quite capital intensive, and as we start getting further out into the suburbs, there's that cost benefit trade off between the ridership and the cost and, and what LRT needs to do. And so a, a larger part of stage three, as opposed to stage one and stage two, is even if we don't build it in the immediate future, we're protecting those corridors um, for future use. And the city is making a statement that um, the future of rapid transit 
uh, for the city is primarily based on light rail technology and not bus rapid transit as it was previously. So what does stage three LRT hopefully do? It's, it's gonna span the entire city all the way from Canada to Orleans and down to Barhaven. Uh, completion of the, the Confederation line, conversion of the West and Southwest Transitway corridors to light rail transit. Uh, from a planning perspective, I'm, I'm a planner, not an engineer. So the LRT is a, a really great tool uh, connecting the Canada and Barhaven town centers to LRT, allow those town centers to um, be the, the real focal points for future growth and intensification that they're meant to be. One of the big differences you'll see when stage three does get built is there's a much greater use of elevated alignments for the LRT as opposed to stages one and two. Um, there's really two primary reasons behind that. One, um, for the Confederation line, it, it's meant to run as a fully grade separated system. So no interaction with um, cars or pedestrians or cyclists. It's a completely grade separated. And as we get out into Canada and Barhaven, the ground conditions are extremely challenging. So elevated alignments allow a cost-effective approach um, that's less disruptive and, and much more cost-effective to keep extending the LRT further out. And recognizing where we are right now in, in the middle of a pandemic, and certainly there are some questions as to why we would continue to need to expand rapid transit, but um, certainly stage three, um, the city sees it as a way to build back better, uh, continue to drive a shift to a multimodal city and provide improved mobility choices for residents, and really meet the climate change challenge. The uh, electric LRT allows for um, decarbonization of the transport system, so we're replacing a lot of diesel buses that are currently running long distances across the green belt into the suburban communities with environmentally friendly electric light rail transit. So I'll quickly go through the three main components of what is called stage three LRT. Um, I was actually involved, I was the deputy project manager slash project manager for the Canada LRT and I'm the deputy project manager for Barhaven LRT EA. So for Canada LRT, the, the planning and EA study was completed. It was actually done uh, two years ago last month. We were, received the statement of completion from the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change, or sorry, <laughs> Conservation and Parks. The Canada LRT is 11 kilometers of grade separated LRT extending from Moody Drive in the east, so the end of stage two, out to Hazeldean in the Stittsville community of Canada. There's eight proposed stations, some seven of which are new stations, one of which uh, Terry Fox is really an existing station that will be converted to LRT. Um, the city is very big on providing improved and new facilities for active transportation as part of rapid transit projects. So as part of the LRT, there will be a parallel multi-use pathway built along the alignment, as well as substantial improvements to pedestrian and cycling connections leading to and from the stations. There's a, a focus on getting people to start their journey um, by cycling or walking to an LRT station though in both the Canada and Barhaven um, extensions, there are also significant park and rides existing and, and some new proposed that'll help extend the, um, the catchment areas for the LRT. And speaking of Canada, there are two new park and rides proposed, one of which would be at Palladium Station, and then the other one down at the end of the line at Hazeldean. Because of um, the distance and ridership and cost benefit that I spoke to earlier, there's a phased implementation for the Canada LRT, which has been proposed. So phase one would run from Moody to Terry Fox, about uh, four kilometers across the green belt, and gets you to Canada Town Centre. And then subsequent to that, uh, extend from there to Palladium, and then from there to Hazeldean. And finally, in, in 2018, um, when we did the functional design for this project, we estimated a 1.85 capital cost for the project. I can quickly run through some of the, the major stations. Um, the first one inside Canada is at March Eagleson. So down here on the bottom of the um, slide, we have the existing Eagleson Park and Ride. So we're proposing a a separate pedestrian walkway that would take you over the highway and connect into the station, which will be on the north side of the highway with the LRT running left to right. 
and there'll be a small bus terminal there. So future tie into a March Road bus rapid transit corridor and local buses serving Canada would, would lead you into this station. Terry Fox Station is uh, the end of, I guess, phase one of the Canada LRT. So it is an existing uh, bus rapid transit station with a park and ride. So the idea here would be to try to reuse as much of the existing infrastructure as possible and insert the LRT along the south side of the existing bus loop and reconfigure the bus loop. Right now, the buses kind of um, run around the island. Um, we would look at having all the buses run along the south side of that island with a sort of a cross-platform connection to the light rail transit. And then as part of the station, we're proposing a uh, future pedestrian bridge over the highway so that people who live in the communities on the south side of Canada Town Centre are able to get to the LRT. Finally, um, Palladium Station at the Canadian Tire Centre or whatever it's called this year. Um, station would, would serve the, the major event where the senators are and look like they'll be staying for the foreseeable future. So again, this is where the LRT is, is elevated. We come over the Queensway and we stay elevated for the station um, between Cyclone Taylor Boulevard and, and Palladium Drive on the east side. And then overhead walkway connections both between the station and the Canadian Tire Centre. And then another walkway that would co um, cross over Huntmar Drive to a park and ride and bus terminal on the west side on a currently vacant piece of the land. So moving on to the Barhaven LRT. So this is a planning and EA study that's currently ongoing. You may have heard towards the end of last year at uh, the functional design at least was um, approved by city council. So now we're moving into the EA phase of the study. This is another 10 kilometers of fully segregated electric LRT, seven new stations, or sorry, seven LRT stations, three of which are new and four of which are existing stations converted from bus rapid transit to light rail transit. Unlike the Canada LRT where there was a corridor protected for bus rapid transit, but not very much infrastructure have been, has been built. In this case, there is actually um, the Southwest Transway exists as a, as a bus only roadway from um, Hunt Club all the way down into Barhaven Town Center. So we would be converting that from buses to, to rail. And as part of that, one of the, the major drivers for this project are three major rail grade separations of the Via Rail Line. So Woodruff Avenue, the Southwest Transway and Fallowfield Road. We'd have new bridges um, crossing over the Via Rail Line. And one of the things we did as part of the project because there's some uncertainty as to when LRT might be funded and extended, um, those structures are designed that they can proceed independently in advance of the LRT, uh, including the transit bridge. So you could build it as a, um, as a bus bridge and come back later and convert it. And there, there's some throwaway to that, but we've come up with a pretty good solution that will allow that to happen relatively easily. Um, Tied with the Barhaven LRT is, is a train storage and servicing facility. So the Confederation Line has a major train yard at Belfast, which serves stage one and most of stage two. They're building a secondary facility out at Moody Drive. One of the reasons why stage two was moved um, from Bayshore to Moody. But because the Barhaven LRT, um, the distance between those facilities and the Moody and Belfast yards, and then also the way it works with the the tie-in at Lincoln Field between the two branches, um, OC Transport and the Rail Office asked us to, to identify a site for a small train storage and servicing facility that could store, I think, eight trains along the line. So it's a smaller scale facility, allows for overnight storage of trains and, and um, minor running repairs and maintenance, uh, cleaning of trains in between uh, uh, peak periods. And that's gonna be located just off of uh, Green Bank um, Green Bank Road adjacent to the Via Rail Line. And at the very end of the line, we, at Barhaven Town Centre, we have a major transfer terminal between buses and rail. Again, there's planned bus rapid transit, at-grade bus rapid transit facilities along Chapman Mills Drive and Green Bank that will tie into the LRT terminus. There's a 250 space park and ride proposed there to help people who live further out on the south side of the jock because the existing uh, park and ride lots in the Barhaven community are largely at capacity, provides a little bit of additional um, 
space for that activity to occur. Then we've identified a $3 billion capital cost project um, for this, but a good chunk of that, about 400 million of that, is tied up in the, um, the rail grade separations at Woodruff and Fallow Fields um, in itself. I'll just share a few um, renderings from the Barhaven LRT extension. So as I mentioned, uh, elevated LRT is, is very much a thing as part of stage three. So this is the proposed Tallwood station. So this is just um, at the intersection of Woodruff and Tallwood Meadowlands. So on the southwest corner, we'd have an elevated LRT station uh, immediately adjacent to the City of Ottawa archives. And this part of the corridor is actually has been protected for rapid transit. There's a um, a strip along the west side of Woodruff Avenue. And so we would take that and that's where the LRT would be built. And then further down in the Pian Sports Plex, very similar again, you know, at the functional design stage, it's more about the footprint of the facility than the actual architecture. This is more to give people an idea that we'd have an elevated station here. It's gonna be on the, the west side of Woodruff. We have a pedestrian bridge spanning over Woodruff to allow people to cross into the Nepean Sportsplex facility. This is a view looking southwest over the proposed Woodruff and uh, transit grade separations of the Via Rail lines. You can see in the far background is uh, the Fallowfield Road grade separation and then the, in the middle distance is the existing Fallowfield Park and Ride and what will be the future Fallowfield LRT station. And there's a really good opportunity here to integrate that in the future with the existing Via Rail station. Uh, Via Rail has plans advancing to double track their rail corridor, which we think is gonna necessitate a um, rebuild of the existing Via Rail station. So there's a, some potential synergy if the timing is right to actually, instead of have two separate structures uh, in the future, you can see a single integrated LRT and intercity rail station here, which would be really cool. And finally, at the end of the line, uh, Barhaven Center. So it's Chapman Mills Drive, sort of running from east to west at the bottom of the page. And the blue rectangle is the footprint of the um, LRT platforms with the bus terminal and 250 space park and ride on the west side. Ultimately, on the east side of the LRT alignment and station is planned to be um, a Barhaven a Civic Center, which is going to be a focal point for what um, we're calling the new Barhaven downtown. So in the short term, the park and ride is planned to be on the west side of the LRT. It can actually advance independently of that. There's some desire to see that happen sooner rather than later. As I mentioned, the existing park and rides in Barhaven, uh, well, at least, at least before March 2020, we're operating at capacity every day. So there's an opportunity here that the park and ride could be built uh, and be used as part of the existing BRT system and then ultimately, one of the ideas is uh, when they build a civic complex on the east side, the park and ride could be integrated uh, into that in some sort of either underground or structured parking to free up that land for the um, more intense town center style of development that's envisaged. And finally, um, the Gatno extension with a big question mark on it. Um, it is identified in the transportation master plan. This would be a short extension of the Trillium line across the Ottawa River um, to Gatineau and link up with the Rapi bus system there. Be greatly assist in, in managing into provincial transit demand. But as you may or may not know, um, Gatineau has actually advanced its own plans for an LRT, a, a different type of LRT. And they're proposing to use the Portage Bridge um, and come across that and into downtown Ottawa. So that's kind of the current focus on interprovincial transit planning. So in the meantime, um, the, city is, the city of Ottawa is advancing a study to provide for interim conversion of the Prince of Wales, or I guess now to be known the Chief Commander Bridge to active transportation uses. And I think you'll see that uh, happening within the next year or so. And the next steps, I sort of talked a little bit earlier about how stage three is more of an idea than an actual project yet. So um, Canada LRT does have um, EA approval. So it is ready and waiting to proceed into the next phase of design, which would be preliminary engineering and then procurement. So 
hopefully I think um, there's a lot of a lot of noise about building back better and infrastructure dollars flowing. And I think the stage three, at least Canada and Barhaven projects would be key to the city um, city's asks as part of that. As I mentioned, Barhaven LRT, the functional design was approved by city council in November of last year. And the transit project assessment process is actually gonna be initiated um, very shortly. We're just uh, doing some pre-consultation activities with the ministry and our um, indigenous stakeholders before we launch the notice of commencement. So stay tuned for that. And then finally, as I mentioned with um, the Gatineau LRT, really the, the current focus is on what STO and the Ville de Gatineau's plans are for LRT. And so there's an environmental assessment advancing for an interim multi-use pathway using that bridge. I always like to end this because I'm, I'm, I'm the upfront guy. I've been working on stage three, well, probably for three or four years now. So long in advance of uh, even stage one opening. So beyond stage three, what, we might, what might we see to, to sort of to build Ottawa into a transit city? So as I mentioned, there's the, the STO LRT and a lot of current noise around um, a potential for an interprovincial transit loop, which would be um, like a downtown circulator tramway along Wellington Street that would loop back over through the Bywood Market and over into to, uh, the Hull sector of Gatineau. Carling Avenue is identified in the transportation master plan for an at grade LRT. So again, not, not like the Confederation line, it would be more of a, a tram style LRT as you see in the image here, which is actually from, from Edinburgh in Scotland. So that is a, a, a different flavor of LRT and uh, more of a, a linear corridor as opposed to serving higher speed, high capacity and nodal type development. I'm always, you know, uh, the transportation master plan is currently being looked at for updating. So there may be other corridors moving forward that we haven't even heard about. So I think with that, I will conclude my presentation and I will turn it back over to you, Eric. And I, I've only taken us two minutes over. So. No, thank you. Excellent uh, presentation and uh, appreciate your effort on that. Uh, we are, um, again, the Q&A is lagging behind a little bit in terms of people asking questions, but again, I'll encourage anybody um, when they get a hold of us to ask the question, and I am appreciating everyone's uh, patience. Uh, we still have the vast majority of our presenters still here, so that's great. When you said elevated uh, uh, LRT, I got excited. I thought we were uh, going to take us uh, uh, like Blade Runner, and we were going to see flying cars, and then I was going to ask where our bullet train is, but uh, I guess we're going to have to wait for that, Paul, a little bit. But uh, fascinating uh, presentation and a glimpse into the future about uh, where things might head. Um, we do have, let's see now. Um, let's, uh, let's uh, oh, we, we have, if, if people will indulge us, it is, it is uh, 3.03. So let's, let's take uh, five minutes to uh, answer a couple of questions, Paul. So um, the first question we have is, there was discussion about baseline bus rapid transit. Is that still a goal? Or what's the status of this versus light rail transit? Um, it is still a go. Uh, Funnily enough, I, I was the project manager for the baseline road uh, BRT EA. So that project uh, has actually advanced into preliminary engineering and detailed design, but is currently unfunded. So it, okay. it will be built as an at grade bus rapid transit. So it'll look very similar to what the city has built along. Um, Chapman Mills Drive in Barhaven between, um, I guess, between Longfields and, and Woodruff. Okay, great. And one other quick question. Um, a question is, uh, wasn't part of the track by the Bayview Bridge removed, so it doesn't connect anymore, question mark? Yes, that is, that is correct. Um, however, the, the alignment of the existing Trillium Line platform at the north end of Bayview, that would that was what would be extended to cross over the bridge. So you would, uh, you would be able to extend that. You would have to build a, a couple of hundred meters of new track to link into the bridge. And, and really the condition of the track over the bridge, just, just like when the original O-Train pilot project was built in 2001, they, they started off using the existing old jointed rail that had been there for probably 30, 40 years and quickly had to 
rip all that up and replace it with continuously welded rail. So I would assume that all the rail across the bridge would have to be replaced with new rail. Excellent. Okay, so those were the two obvious questions we had. Uh, appreciate your time again, Paul, and uh, taking the time out to help us out. So thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I'll move quickly to, uh, to wrap ourselves up here. We have a number of events uh, coming up. Uh, we're still kind of hoping we'll be able to do something later in March for the ski day with all the, uh, all the measures in place for safety. Uh, and again, depending on the, the protocols, the Women's Day event, you're, you're getting some uh, save the date for that already. So please plan uh, to be a part of that. Um, Public Works Week uh, is coming up May, I believe I heard May 16th. So that'll be another event coming up. Um, and then you can see the other events uh, uh, on your screen here that'll uh, happen a little bit later and maybe maybe we'll be lucky enough to to get in person. So once again, I want to uh, I want to thank all of you for spending a couple of hours and again, thank you for your patience. Uh, uh, we never know um, when these with these new formats how our timing's going to go. so I appreciate all of you hanging in. Uh, to the end and being a part of this. So thank you all for your time. Thank you for asking questions. Uh, again, if you have something you, you felt you needed answered, um, please email us at uh, that email there. And what we'll do is we will send out a uh, these links. You don't have to furiously try to copy them. Uh, I believe we have everybody that's registered. We can send all this information out to you so that these are different ways, uh, our website, uh, email, and of course, please uh, plug into our LinkedIn because that's a very common way that now we're advertising all our events in addition if uh, you're on our list for email. So on that note, uh, uh, we're gonna wrap up. Uh, again, thank you all for your time. Thank you to the presenters who took the time to pr present their, um, their projects and uh, appreciate their, their time. And this is really what our organization does is allow people to come and talk about interesting projects and share them with all of you. And again, I appreciate all of your um, patience and uh, sitting through our business meeting and allowing that to be concluded. So have a great evening, everybody, and uh, appreciate your time again. Take care.